So when we think about this exhibition as being a, in some ways, a celebration of the non-monastic tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, we have a figure of Milarepa, one of the most celebrated of all of uh, Tibetan Buddhist yogic practitioners. He had this beautiful set of 100,000 songs in which he celebrated his mountain hermitages. He said, let others go to the monasteries to light butter lamps. I will stay here in my mountain cave and light the butter lamp in my heart. And this actually representation of his right hand up to his ear was actually a symbol of the idea of expressing his enlightened sensibilities through song and imparting that to others in that form. So we see him, as he talked about it, he said, let others go to their uh, temples filled with, with idols and, and, uh, and shrines. I'll be here in my, my temple filled with alpine flowers and, and running streams. So with this whole celebration of the Tibetan environment and the power of the mountains. So that's the kind of songs that Milarepa here sang. And we see this wonderful depiction of a shrine created as a mountain, you see actually dancing uh, leopards and snow lions, and it's a, a wonderful evocation of the natural environment of Tibet within a, within a shrine box with, with Milarepa at its center. And this was, of course, the iconic mountain Kailash, or Kang Rinpoche, as it was called in Tibetan. This represented for Tibetans, both whether they were Bun or Buddhist, as well as for Hindus, as well as for Jains, it was the center of the earth. And this is a mountain in western Tibet uh, where Milarepa spent lots of time in his cave. So we, that's again represented here in a uh, contemporary photograph of this iconic mountain that for Tibetans was the center of the earth. It was a place in which a lot of these traditions actually cross-fertilized. It was a place where Hindu Shaivite yogis came from India. For Bun, it was also their sacred mountain before it was a Buddhist mountain. And one of the great things about Milarepa, he was particularly associated with the practice of the, the six yogas, as they were called, what we've called in this exhibition the yogas of fire and light, because his main practice through which he achieved enlightenment was called the, the yoga of inner fire, of tumo. And this, was a, this is the quintessential tantric yoga. It's the kundalini, it's the chandali in Sanskrit. It's about arousing this internal energy that burns through all of the kind of obscuring mental concepts that prevent us from engaging the fullness of our being. So we see that even represented in the wall behind of this yogi with the long dreadlocks from eastern Tibet pressing on what were called the wind gates in the groin in order to bring these energies up through the central core of the body. So what we're seeing with Milarepa, we're seeing with contemporary practitioners following in his tradition was the engagement with these these tantric diagrams representing a transformed uh, experience of human embodiment. We've come from the room before, which was showing us the way these practices are engaged through sacred dance, the way they're engaged through these secret physical yogic practices, which are shown here in film form, ways in which we dynamically engage the body through very forceful techniques. And what we have in this room were the six yogas, where once that's done and you've opened up these channels, these currents of energy in the body, you begin to work with them internally. So that started with what were called the six yogas. And that started out with Tumo, the yoga of inner heat. That move that was supported and sometimes by the sexual yogas in which that heat and that energy could be increased. That led to the fire becoming light, the clear light, the luminosity of the heart-mind. You worked with that in states of sleep. There were techniques for gaining conscious awareness during the dream state, what we would now call lucid dreaming, and being able to change the narrative scripts of the subconscious mind during the dream state and be able to use that as a basis for practice. The other, the other two remaining uh, of the six yogas was the transference of consciousness out of the body uh, at the time of death and also a way of working with the mind meditatively and yogically during a uh, period called the bardo after the death of the body in which the, the mind was a disembodied state would go through a 49 day transit before it was born and brought back into another body. So these were dynamic forms of yoga that could be done at any stage of, of waking, dreaming, sleeping, uh, and dying. And dying. And dying. Yep. It was basically the full spectrum of life and death became the arena for, for tantric Buddhist practice. So it wasn't anything, there was no exclusions. Every, every moment of life became an opportunity for engaging with the fullness of our being whether we were sleeping, dreaming, waking, dying, 
everything became an opportunity to bring about that illumination of the subconscious mind and to recognize that as a field of, as it was described in the tradition, luminosity, clarity, and in a way beyond thought and emotion as we normally conceive it into a more expanded sense of wisdom, compassion, and universal empathy.